<laughs> well, it's like any, like a Buddhism is a convention. You know, how you use it is up to you. You can use it, you know, it's unskillfully, and then the result is and it's not liberating. So the encouragement is to use it skillful, what is meant to be used for. Like the whole point of the Buddhist teaching is liberation from ignorance. And, uh, but sometimes we can, you know, you meet Buddhist monks who operate from strong views and, and uh, very divisive and, and uh, you know, they've got, they, they end up, you know, creating themselves in, and, and forming and causing a lot of division and, and confusion in the world. But it's not because they're Buddhist, it's because they're using the convention not, uh, unskillfully. Like, like a Buddha Rupa, you know, a Buddha, Buddha image, it's made, created for, you know, as an icon of peace and encouragement and inspiration. But I could take a Buddha Rupa and knock you on the head with it, kill you. But that's not what it's made for. <laughs> so it's up to me what I do, you know, whether I use it for, you know, to help and be mindful or use it as a weapon that harms others. So, uh, you know, like, uh, I was very fortunate in my monastic, like, because I met Numpa Cha, and uh, he was very skilled teacher, and, uh, and he, he was very good at um, helping me understand the value of monastic life. Before I was, I didn't know much about monastic life, and I was interested in meditation only. And uh, so monastic life was more, I liked the idea of it, but, uh, you know, I didn't know how, a lot of the vina seemed so complicated and fussy, and I didn't quite get the point of a lot of it at first. But then, uh, you know, over the years, I began to see how to use the structure for mindfulness. How not to just dismiss Vinaya because I think it's fussy and it's unnecessary like some monks do, or to just become obsessed with it and, and, and grasp it too much where I can't see beyond it. And this is where like mindfulness is gives you that perspective, you know, your own personal tendencies to use this tradition you know, how can I, you know, you're a different person, you're a different nature than I do, so you, all I can do is encourage you, uh, but the, the main encouragement is awakened attention, mindfulness, and, and then you see, uh, if you are using the form wrongly, or if it's creating more problems for you, or others, or if you, you know, if, if being a monk, uh, you know, it, causing you distress, you can blame it on the monastic system, or maybe you, you just change your attitude towards it. Because, like, uh, uh, a Western, like, coming from West Coast America in 1966, you know, you're, I'm from, you know, I was at the University of California, so you're in an environment where it's all totally free, and uh, do what you want, no boundaries, you know, and the drug scene was growing and, and a very tolerant, open society. Uh, and and uh, what is being free to experience life, whatever, you know, and then, then coming to Watapong in Isan, where it's the most conservative, traditional, monastery in Thailand <laughs> where it's all structured and, and and you have to do it this way and not that way and have to conform and I always saw myself as a non-conformist and then suddenly I'm in the most conforming form that you could possibly create you know very traditional very structured very strict 
in the form and of course it, it brought up all kinds of strong emotions uh, that I, I never had in California. But the aim of Lung Po Cha was, was to observe you know, because I couldn't understand the language. At first I didn't, you know, I didn't understand uh, Isan dialect or Bangkok Thai either. So I, I was, I just have to sit there and listen to, to Ajahn Chah go on for five hours, you know, and uh, almost every evening. And, um, and of course, you're, you know, you're sitting like this, up here, and at first, if you're not used to doing that, it's very painful. And and I never sat like that in California. And <laughs> so I, I, uh, you know, had a lot of aversion and anger. And Ajahn Chah said right from the beginning, your practice is developing patience. And well, I agreed with him because I realized I was I didn't. Patience is not a virtue in the states. It's like you know you you if you want something you get it now. You don't have to wait. And and then the Watpa Pong in those days was very primitive. You know, very basic, and it was all about waiting and being patient and knowing your place. And the most junior monk in the line and and. Uh, all the things that would would grate against the my per, my cultural conditioning, and the only way I could really deal with it was I could leave. You know, nobody was forcing me to stay there, but I, but I could also I trusted Lung Po Cha. So I I and then his teaching, even though it was I didn't understand, his, you know, his uh, day, his talks. Yet he was good at, at getting you to look at look at yourself, and I could do that. So by doing that, looking at my impatience and anger and all that, I developed more patience. So I, you know, I developed a lot of trust in Ajahn Chah, because he wasn't telling me that I had to do things, and and it wasn't scaring me. He was encouraging me to develop qualities that are necessary for understanding reality in a situation that that was very different from what I'd ever lived in before. But the thing that I liked about it was that I felt I was living a good life. I, 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 it was, I admired monks like that, like Lung Po Cha and the monks that I trained with, they were, you know, they were admirable. The way they lived and their commitment impressed me. And, and I, I, and coming from a hedonistic life, I didn't feel that respect for hedonistic people. You know, the kind of free spirits in Berkeley could be charming and entertaining, but I didn't really respect it. And I didn't respect myself. For living like that, so then the then the uh, more and more living with Lung Po Cha, I began to develop respect for what I'm doing and and a kind of gratitude and and then the the whole form of, that was presented, I began to understand it better as I developed it and used it and saw how how to use it. Just like with, with Vinaya, just accept the totality. 
the totality of it. And, uh, and try to operate within that structure and just observe your, your own doubt or rebelliousness or attachment. And then we can become so strict in Vinaya that we're always looking at other monks to see that they're keeping it. <laughs> and we can get very angry if we see a monk breaking a rule. Then we know we're too attached to it. So you always, you know, you're, you know, it works both ways. You can become fastidious and obsessed with trying to make everyone conform to being too lax, where everything's okay. But then the point of the Vinaya is, a, is awareness, awaken. So I found the attitude was um, was to observe myself. You know, I, I conform to the Vinaya as best I can wherever I'm at. And then, as as I learned it at, with Lung Po Cha, and even in England, I that's the Vinaya I tried to uh, develop there. Uh, but also, I I the aim was not to just create an Ajahn Chah cult in England, but to you know use it for as a skillful tool to be aware of of uh, your own mental state. Because like being confined, being limited in, in, in action and speech, if you're from a society, from a life where there aren't any limits, then, then that limitation can be incredibly, make one very angry or rebellious or frightened, you know. So, so these are all mental states that arise. And and you and and then this awareness of them is is just to be aware, not to think that you should feel any other thing, but observe what you are feeling. And then then the training within, like here at Nanachara, that is just to conform to the Vinaya. So they aren't asking you to do anything bad, you know. You're not ever asked to do something that is unwholesome. Sometimes you don't particularly want to do what you have to or what they want you to do but you know you're not you're not doing anything bad and then uh, and then uh, but the main point is to observe the state of mind <clears throat> and then you know like so then you you if you you know then you become a Vinaya fanatic then you're always trying to make everybody else do it. And that's a very unpleasant mental state, to be always looking at somebody else, worried they're going to do it wrong. And you look at that, that's a very miserable kind of mental state in your own mind. So, uh, you just keep learning. How do you use forms like that? Because Dhamma is formless, it's all about letting go, you know, it's the ultimate freedom, letting go, freedom, not attached to anything. And in in America, they love that, you know. Uh, you know, they think we're just a bunch of screwed up, attached, repressed, anal retentive freaks, <laughs> because we're you know we're strict in the vinaya. Or <laughs> because Dhamma is about freedom, and it is, it's about letting go, non-attachment. But then, you know, in the, in the traditional form, uh, it's uh, the, when the Buddha was passing on, and his attendant, Ananda, said, what will we do without, when you're dead, when you're gone, who will teach us? We won't have any teacher. And the Buddha says, I leave you the Dhamma. And then he said, Lavinia. Lavinia is all this form, you know, rules from, you know, from severe things to little things. And and so then, uh, in the West, like in Britain, they love they love Dhamma teaching, but Vinaya is not not highly appreciated because it, it's 
it goes against this idea of freedom. It's about restraint and 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 restriction. But at my age now, you realize the wisdom behind that because uh, freedom. Is, this realm is is like this, it's not a free realm. We've got so much pressures on us just from the aging process, from loss, from the changing weather, the climate change, the political changes, political cha- economic problems, family problems, personal crises, and on and on like that. It, you know, where's the freedom? We've always got tension, stress in our lives. And, and that's what people talk about now, is stress. Uh, you know, I even interpret the First Noble Truth, some monks, as stress. Because uh, stress is, you know, the, with all the uh, uh, fa- fantastic technology, it creates more stress. And uh, like this morning, my iPad, the internet, The Wi-Fi didn't work. I could feel stress. (laughs) That I never felt when I didn't have an iPad. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, it's a a wonderful thing, you know, you have an iPad, it's a kind of magical instrument, but it it also is a condition that creates stress. Because you you know you you become you want to touch it and it works and then you just go on and the things don't quite do the do what you want or pack up or don't connect and then you feel this. The important thing is to be aware of it because this realm is about stress. And in the monastic life, uh, we can create stress around that too worrying about our purity and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of resentments and jealousies. It's based on who's senior to who, then there's a lot of, creates a lot of uh, egotistical problems. You know, I, that monk senior to me is hopeless, you know. I'm better than he is. <laughs> but it's all part of the practice. It's not like, Becoming a monk changes you into a saint. It, it just you puts you in a in a in a vehicle to carry you, to restrain you, hold you until you can observe more how to what ultimate liberation really is. And it's all about here. It's not about building the best monastery where everybody, every monk, every nun is wonderful. It's about freeing yourself from delusion here and now. And that you can do. You can't create a perfect monastery. Wherever monastery you go to, you'll find a lot of things you don't like. (laughs) A lot of things you like. So, I mean, it's just the way the world is. Like uh, wanting you know, like American culture is about ideals. It's about how things should be. So, so you're, you, you know, you're very much aware of, of you know, how things should be. Uh, and you can create an ideal in your mind, which is perfect, you know, about a political system that's totally fair and just and, and a society where everybody's equal and 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 I like communism was in the previous century was offering that you know it's kind of ideal uh, idealism carried to to a high level and uh, but it wasn't based on dhamma on reality it was based on america on the human ability to create ideals but this is not an ideal realm. This is the way it is. You know, it's a changing realm. It's not what it should be, but it is the way it is. So, like mindfulness, then is is your ability to observe that, to not to always 
try to change it to fit, to try to conform to some idea you have, but more aware of the way things actually are and what being human is, what being a man is, what being a monk is, is like this. And it's not about becoming anything, it's about recognizing. Then the form itself, since we all agree to it, the Vikusanga, <clears throat> you know, so we're all agreed to live within this restraint. Then we have a lot of, um, it's very bonding in its own way, you know, you, you, you can trust it, you know, living in a Buddhist monastery, you can take a lot for granted, you know, the, the people in it are doing their best to be honest and trustworthy. In a society that people are paranoid and suspicious. Have I convinced you? <laughs> I'd be a good salesman, wouldn't I? Ha, 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 ha.